Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we're asking that as we've heard in singing, you will speak to us tonight in Jesus' name. You are the Lord, you are the Master. We are your children, we are your followers. And Father, we're asking that your voice will speak to us in Jesus' name. We pray that your voice will be so clear, will be so distinct, that as we hear your word, will never be the same again in Jesus' name. That you will change us. And you will use us to bring mighty change to our communities in Jesus' name. Speak to us. Help us. Give us the grace to follow after you. In Jesus' name we pray. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19. I'm reading again from verse 20. I'll read verse 20 to you, then I'll read from verses 23 on through to 27. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. 23. At the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silver smith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation, and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but also throughout all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away much people, saying that there be, there be no gods which are made with hands, so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshippers. We've been long in the Acts of the Apostles, and by now you understand why we are keeping long in the Acts of the Apostles. It must strike you that the New Testament gives much space in writing to the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then immediately, you don't have a book of doctrine following, but you have the activities, the events, the programs, the progress, the problems, the persecutions in the early church. For us to understand that if you are going to have a church today, if it is still the same God, the same Christ, the same Holy Ghost, and if it is still the same, the Word of God, the same Word of God that is preached, that you will be able to see the things that will be happening today in the ministry of the world and in the ministry of the church. And it will be very similar to what happened in those days. Now from the things we're reading, you will know one serious point. We've heard many times when people say, prayer changes things. That's true. But you must now understand, not only prayer, preaching changes things. And when you think about it, you will see it's not only prayer, but preaching making a great change in people, in things, in society, in the church. And as we have gone through the Acts of the Apostles, you come across prayer changing things, you also come across preaching changing things. And if you are going to judge whether we are praying well or not, you will judge by the praying that you read about in the ministry of Jesus Christ and in the Acts of the Apostles in the Bible. If you are also going to find out whether our preaching is according to what God wants, 
you'll find out whether the preaching is changing things or not. If the preaching is not changing anybody, if the preaching is not changing anything, if the preaching is not having any effect, conviction, conversion, consecration in the hearts, in the lives of people, that preaching is worthless because it's not according to New Testament preaching. But you pick up those preachers one by one. John the Baptist, very early in the New Testament, not only prayer, the preaching, it affected Herod, affected Herodias, affected the people, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, everybody. Preaching changes things. Then you pick up the Lord Jesus Christ. Savior, that's true, but teacher and preacher. And if you want to know how important preaching is in the New Testament, look at Jesus Christ. And his preaching changed people, changed things. It turned things around. And then you come on to these um, apostles in the Acts of the Apostles. In fact, the onlookers, the people of the world, they said, you have turned Jerusalem upside down by your prayers? No. Prayer is good. Prayer is wonderful. Prayer is high. Prayer is something that makes you to get right into the presence of God and talk to God about people, about the world, about things all over. But their preaching was the thing that made the change. You have turned Jerusalem upside down by your preaching by what you are saying and if it is still to be the same today we must begin to evaluate our preaching preaching changes things and it changes people and that's what you have in Acts of the Apostles chapter 19 from verse 20 so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed and um, if you are going to make progress in your life as a Christian worker you must have to learn preaching the New Testament style. Now the preaching in New Testament style wasn't soft, kind. The preaching in the New Testament church wasn't something that was neutral. You could never tell where the man was, whether he's on the right hand side believing in holiness or not, or he's on the left hand side believing that everybody must be committing sin every day. You cannot tell New Testament preaching was not neutral. It was something direct and definite, dynamic, that people knew this where they are. In the New Testament preaching, there was no neutrality. Are they telling us to worship the only true God through Jesus Christ? Or are they telling us that you could worship God through whichever way you like? Jesus, Caesar, Herod, through policy, or through politics, or through religion, or through the Bible. Just, you know, a neutral type of preaching. New Testament preaching was not neutral. It was direct and dynamic. You could tell this is what they are saying. And you, as a zonal leader, area leader, house fellowship leader, you as a soul winner, evangelist, pastor, preacher, if your preaching is going to be as it was in the New Testament, it must be definite. You must not be ashamed of what you stand for. If you believe in repentance, say it out. If you believe that when we come to the Lord, we'll be born again, our lives will change. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. All things are become new. Say it out. If you believe it is possible to be sanctified, purified, made holy by the power of the Lord, say it out. Don't be neutral. Don't say, well, some people believe this, some people believe that. People are not asking you to come and tell us a catalog of doctrines. What do people in the village believe? People in the town believe? People overseas believe? People in Lagos believe? What the people are expecting? Zona leader, area leader, house fellowship leader, or even a writer of the word of God preaching to people through writing. People are asking, what does God say? And what God says will be definitely direct and dynamic. And when it comes, it makes a change in the lives of 
people and so you find that the word of God grew and prevailed and then we're told in verse 23 the same time there arose no small stir about that way that's it you know what Jesus said he said do not think that I've come to bring peace ease quietness in the world what, what did he mean he meant I came to disturb you you know if you've been resting as an idol worshiper if you've been resting in religion if you've been resting in your good works if you've been resting in all the evil things you're doing Jesus said I come to disturb you don't you think that I come and when I preach when you hear the preaching of the New Testament you'll still be as you were before there'll be a stir you'll be stirred up you'll be disturbed and it's either that disturbance will get you nearer to God and you get converted or that disturbance will get you farther away and you show your rebellion and you show your enmity against the truth of the Lord the word of God and that's what happened here a riot came up and a passage tells us because the cause of the riot the, the characteristics of riots it doesn't matter where those riots are first century or 20th century Ephesus or Lagos Rome or Japan in a civilized world or in a primitive society there are characteristics of riots and you find that in this passage here and then the coming of the riot bringing that riot into a calm silencing the people that were trying to make trouble but the point I want you to understand today is that prayer changes things but also preaching New Testament preaching dynamic preaching and true preaching changes things and changes people in the passage I've read to you you can see that the preaching had been going on and brothers and sisters it's not just um, you know hold on your religion to yourself don't share anything with your neighbors don't cause any disturbance let's have a peaceful atmosphere in this city of Ephesus you know that all these Ephesians are idol worshippers so please uh, when you go back home hold on your religion to yourself don't let anybody know that you have been preached to and you have something going on in your heart so be very very careful and be gentle and mild about it no Paul wasn't a preacher like that Moses wasn't a preacher like that Joshua wasn't a preacher like that and all these stewards all the servants all the great men in the Bible they were not preachers like that you heard their preaching it affected your life it affected your community and it brought disturbance in the people that the that in the places that the people went and here we are told in verse 24 for a certain man named Demetrius a silversmith which made silver shrines for Diana brought no small great gain unto the craftsmen now look up here before you can understand this you need some highlights on the history of the ancient times and of Ephesus at that time you see Ephesus was by the standards of those days a big city not only that it was a city that attracted interests attention of other places and the single attraction was because of Diana the god the idol of the Ephesians this idol had been served had been worshipped for many many years and they had sent information out different parts of the world to convince all these different parts of the world that Diana is the idol they must worship and people will come from many parts of the world just to come and see Diana the goddess the idol of the Ephesians not only that this Diana 
idol was made of silver and there were silver smiths just like you have blacksmiths dealing with iron making uh, instruments of farming in our land just like you have goldsmiths working with gold making earrings making uh, necklace making other things so you have silver smiths working with silver but then they were not making instruments for agriculture neither were they making ornaments for beauty and for social things but they were making some small small representations of diana of the idol so that the people that were not able to live in Ephesus, they'll buy these small, small, small shrines and idols and take back home. And so everybody knew. Now, for Demetrius, he was a professional person and he was a craftsman, a silversmith. And he saw that there were so many people wanting to worship this idol that he didn't need to even think about doing any other type of work or using silver for any other thing but just making shrine. Just making shrine. All through the year they will be making all the small, small idols. Waiting for the time of the celebration when people will come from many parts of the world and just be buying. And just be buying. And then eventually... Paul the Apostle himself. Now, you must understand another thing about Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle was a strategist. A person that had plan and goal. Paul the Apostle was not a person that will just preach the gospel. Just preach the gospel. Paul will look at where many, many people will gather together. And he will look at where many people will have the opportunity of hearing what he had to say if you look at first corinthians chapter 16 first corinthians chapter 16 verse 8 but i will tarry at ephesus until pentecost for a great door and effectual is opened unto me and there are many adversaries now Paul knew that these people they always gathered at Ephesus and the time that they will gather also God came to the time of Pentecost and so he said I'm waiting there because I cannot lose the opportunity to miss that crowd that crowd that will come and so as he was preaching he knew that the major thing here was just the idol and he wasn't going to sidetrack the issue he wasn't a jellyfish preacher he wasn't a spineless preacher he wasn't a coward fearful preacher he wasn't a person trying to please all the dignitaries all the great great men coming from all over the world to come and worship diana he wasn't a man pleaser he was a straightforward fearless bold spirit filled preacher of the gospel and he declared the truth with wisdom but not the wisdom of this world that comes to naught but with wisdom from above he declared the word not with enticing words of man's wisdom that were taught in school psychology sociology philosophy and you know try gently he was a person filled with the power of god and he will preach that gospel in the power and demonstration of the holy ghost and and they came and he preached and as he preached the power of god to change lives the power of god to take all those devotions to idolatry away from them the power of god to make the sick to get healed the manifestation of the miraculous just took place and we're told that it got to a peak to a height that even the people that were not christians will try to pretend and they will try to cast out devils by saying we adjure you by jesus whom paul preaches so they will use the name of jesus and the name of paul you know that man was a successful man dynamic man he was a man that you know they knew the name of jesus they also knew his name 
and even these who have not been born again who are having um, you know just trying their luck wanting to cast out devils they use uh, you know this type of formula and then the people were just getting converted and the people that use curious art they were born again they were saved they were converted and they brought all these things together and they burnt them now listen to me they didn't uh, do that secretly and say now we know in Ephesus many many people are idol worshippers and if we're not going to worship the Jew again if we're not going to worship idols again if we're not going to get into magical things again even if we are going to burn all those things do it secretly don't let anybody know that you are born again no if you are born again you can't hide it it's like a rain falling from heaven the rain cannot fall secretly you get there you know rain has fallen here the ground is wet it's like the sun rising in the morning with the rays, the beams that will drive all the darkness away. The sun cannot shine in secret. If the sun is there, you will see it. It's like light. It's like Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. He says, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him and fellowship with him. If Jesus is inside there, you can't hide it. You can't hide it. It's power. His life, his boldness, his glory will shine forth from you. And it is impossible to hide Jesus Christ inside. Listen to me. Jesus Christ was born in the manger. Was it easy to hide him? No, sir. Immediately those angels, they went to those shepherds. They said, if you don't know anything yet, there is Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, the Son of David. He's been born. And he's right there. Go and see him. Herod knew about it. All the other people knew about it. If Jesus comes in, you cannot hide it. If that preaching has affected your life and you are born again and you are not worshipping idols again, you cannot hide it. If you believe in holiness and Jesus Christ has come in to change your life, purify you, you, you cannot hide it. You know, some people say, uh, I'll try to hide what I believe in holiness, standing right reading the Bible and they come to Bible study, they wrap that Bible up in newspaper and they say, where are you going? I am going somewhere. Deeper Life Bible Church is not somewhere. Deeper Life Bible Church is the church of God. So when they ask you, where are you going? I am going to Deeper Life. Oh, you go there? Oh, yes, that's my house on Monday. That's my hospital on Thursday. And that is heaven to me and the gate of heaven on Sunday. Come along with me. You won't hide it if you are born again. But you know the people that wrap the Bible and say, I'm going somewhere, shame on you. Thank God I'm not one of them. I said, thank God I'm not one of them. Are you one of those people? You know, put their Bibles away and then they just uh, say, well, don't let anybody know that I'm following Jesus. I want everybody to know I'm following Jesus Christ. I want everybody to know that preaching changes things and preaching has changed my life. Prayer changes things and prayer has changed my life. And so that's what changed. That's what changed. And then these silversmiths, Demetrius, he realized if we allow this Paul to go on like this, our trade will suffer. Our profession will suffer. Now I want to assure you this. Anywhere there is Bible preaching, New Testament preaching, Christ-like preaching, apostolic preaching, if you like, many things will be changed. And listen to me now. The work ethics in the nation will be changed. When Jesus comes into you, it affects the work that you do. If you are doing a good job, you do that job in a better way. You can cheat again. You can't be unfaithful again. You can steal again. If the gospel comes into your life, it will change your life in the place of work. Not only that, listen to me now. If you are doing a bad work, bad work, evil work, it will so change you that you will not be able to continue. Listen to me. A person has been a prostitute in the hotel and has been you know giving her body away having bad times that they call nice time 
all through the night. And she will not agree to go and get married and set you in a home. And the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ comes into that person's life. You know what will happen? It will change that work of prostitution that she is doing. She cannot continue it. She cannot continue. Of course, it will bring a stir, a disturbance among the customers. And you know if you have been an hotelier yourself, that you have that to tell, and you are just drums of wine, just flowing, day and night, day and night, and all that type of rock music, all that of Afro music, all those evil things are going on, and you are destroying people's lives. The moment that New Testament dynamic preaching comes and affects your life, you can't do that anymore. You can't do it. And if you've been working with, you know, making idols for people, making idols for people, uh, you know, twin idols or juju idol or village idol or family idol and all that you do is just carving idols, carving idols, carving idols. You know, when Jesus Christ takes over your life, when New Testament preaching comes into your life, you won't be able to do that again. That's exactly what happened. And you know, you've been a tailor. And as a tailor, you, you will sew anything. And you know all these uh, new stars that are coming out. And uh, they tell us that it's just a mark of, you know, development and civilization. And the more of your body that they're able to expose for them, the more civilized they think they are. And all these new designers, if you have been a designer before, that you'll design the clothes of the woman in such a way that all the anatomy of the body is, you know, public, is made known. Causing temptation to people all around. That they'll put that scanty dress that is not a dress at all. They'll, they'll put on that woman and then they'll show it and say, this is the new style that has come out. You know, when you are born again, when Jesus Christ takes over your life, that profession, it will be changed. And if you've been sowing all these things, they call slacks for women. The moment you are born again, the moment you become a real child of God, it affects your profession. It affects the work you are doing. And you cannot continue like that again. And if you've been a herbalist, for example, joining this leaf and that leaf and cockroach and um, coconut and coconut and uh, groundnut and um, leaf and sand and ashes all together to give somebody to drink, but you know, when the gospel comes to you, it's not that, well, I'm a Christian now, but I have no other work. That one is no work. That one is no work that is only cheating people. Uh -uh. Who cannot go and take ashes and put inside the paper and say, uh, drink this one. You are giving them poison. You take cockroach, you take um, the back of a poisonous uh, herb, the, a poisonous uh, tree. Then you take some sand, then you take some charcoal, then you, you burn the alligator pepper, and then the lizard, lizard, you burn everything together, you say, I'm going to give you something. You want to have a child, you'll get a child. That's no work. That's poisoning people. And if that is the work you've been doing when you become born again and your life is changed, all that will be taken away in Jesus' name. When that is done, the association of silversmiths, association, you know, today we have association of tailors, association of uh, coppersmiths, association of blacksmiths, association of farmers, association of technicians, association of uh, bicycle riders, association everywhere. They had association. And this man, Demetrius, he called the association together. And you know, the association, it's so bad today that if you don't drink their pan wine with them, if you don't go to meet with them on Sunday, if you don't go to have the meetings that they want everybody to have, they'll say they'll come and carry your machine you're using in your shop. Have you heard of that before? If an association is doing good, it is to help people. A man that has a wife and five children, an association, will go and carry the thing that the man is using to make money to feed his family. They don't care if his wife will get hungry and die. They don't care if all the five children will not go to school. They don't care if that man is not happy because they want him to belong to association. That's a bad, bad thing. 
and associations, if you are there listening to me, understand this. If any association is to do good at all, you will be having pity on the people that are suffering. Not that somebody, because they didn't come to the meeting, because they will not do this, his profession is his personal life. What he wants to do is his personal life. And nobody has a right to just go and take all that that man is using to feed his children and let the children go hungry just because the man will not come to their meeting. But the association was there. And Demetrius, he started making noise. And he started saying, you men, you know that this is our trade. And we have three problems here. Number one, if we allow this poll to continue, something is going to happen. We will lose the gain that we are making. The gain. They, are not, they were not thinking of heaven. They were thinking of the gain. They were not thinking of God, the only true God. They were thinking of their gain. And you know, when you love money, the love of money is the root of all evil. Your wife has been changed by the power of God. But you will not think about the change that has happened. But only because this woman now is not able to sell uh, tobacco. And is not able to sell uh, beer again. That's the only concern. The gain. The gain. Number two. Then the thought of this idol. That if we allow this man Paul to continue like this. Our idol. Nobody will worship the idol. Good luck to you. Who wanted to worship idol before? But that was their concern. Number three, their national concern. That you see, this Ephesus has been made popular, has been promoted in the eyes of the public because of Diana. There was no other thing that made them to have a good image, an acceptable image before all the other people in the other parts of the world except this idol. And he said, if Paul continues like this, then the gain will be lost, the idol nobody will worship, and then all the good things we have from other nations, everything will stop. And do you know that? Today, that's the same thing. Because you must understand in those days, it gave them, listen to me now, it gave them foreign exchange. All these people who are coming from other parts of the world at this, uh, at this time. And you know, they will buy all these shrines with their foreign money as they came. And when you think about the condition today, there are Christians, there are people that are only looking for money. Foreign exchange, hard currency, get this one this way, get this one this way. And they will lose their own soul. They will just push aside the Bible. All they're looking for, the noise in town. is just foreign exchange, foreign exchange, foreign exchange. And they will not know until they begin to compromise. They begin to do things that a believer, real Bible believer, should not get involved in. Because, oh, they say, this thing is going to bring money. This thing is going to bring foreign exchange. But, you know, think about heaven. Think about God. Think about the impact New Testament preaching, New Testament word has made on your life. That's the cause of the riot. And so when Demetrius said all this, trouble started. Paul the apostle had been doing what the Lord wanted him to do. But then the trouble came now because of Demetrius as a ringleader coming out, defending the profession, defending the idolatry and wanting to defend his own city Ephesus. Let's look at verse 28 and when they heard these sayings they were full of wrath and cried out saying great is Diana of the Ephesians you know he had caught all the silver smiths together now listen you must be very intelligent intelligent to be able to judge mob reaction there's something that is called mob psychology that is when you have a lot of people multitude of people and they're going in the same direction if you didn't have understanding of mob psychology you didn't have understanding of mob reaction you will not know what is going on generally one or two people 
can influence a mob, a multitude in the wrong direction. All these multitudes were there. Even though they had seen that some of their relatives were being converted, they didn't think much about it. But then Demetrius rose up. And as a ringleader, he called people of the same interest. He didn't call lawyers. He didn't call the doctors. He didn't call the engineers. He didn't call the farmers. He called the silversmiths. The same interest. If he could approach their mind through the profession and tell them that this new brand of Christianity, this new brand of religion, it's going to affect how money comes in. It's going to affect money for in exchange. It's going to affect the worship of all our citizens. And it's going to affect the image of this city. If we could convince them and they could get angry, then they will be used as a catalyst to make the mob angry. And it's the same today. Now listen to me. That's why we're studying Acts of the Apostles. Sometimes one person in society gets angry. Why? Because his former girlfriend providing cheap prostitution without even money because the ordinary prostitution, you have to go and pay money before you can have the pleasure of sin. But this girlfriend now uh, is cheap prostitution. No money, nothing. Anytime she wants, she wants anything, just goes to the lady and there you are. But now the preaching of the gospel affects that private, common, cheap prostitute. And that gospel changes that woman. And she becomes no more a prostitute but a saint of God. Born again. The life is changed. Now she'll wake up in the morning and read the Bible. In the afternoon, she'll direct her ways according to the word of God. And whenever temptation is coming, this uh, lady, this woman, will be saying, No, 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 it is written. Thou shalt not commit adultery. When temptation is coming, the word of God will come into her that... To avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. And so this um, old boy will come and will say, Hi, how are you there? Oh, and he says, I'm fine in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, what, what happened to you? Where did you get that? I got it at Bagada. You don't mean it. No, you must be plain. In any case, there is um, a jump tonight. There is uh, dancing tonight. And I have this appointment. And we, we're going to have a nice time together. And he says, uh, I'm sorry. All those things don't mean anything to me now. What do you mean? Well, I'm born again. I'm changed. I'm different. Old things are passed away. The things I used to drink, I can't drink them anymore. The things I used to do, I can't do them anymore. The dresses I used to wear, I can't wear them anymore. The bad language I used to use, I can't use them anymore. And all these evil things we did together. In fact, I wanted to come and see you to tell you I'm sorry for all the things I pulled you into now. Go your way, I go my way. I'm going with Jesus. If you want to go with Jesus, God bless you. And uh, ah, so this is what deeper life is uh, all about. And there is man angry, angry because the life has been changed, angry because God has taken this woman and wants to make a mother out of her, angry because God has taken this woman and is going to make a successful personality out of her, angry because the light of the gospel has come in and has driven away the, the darkness of, of sin. Angry because Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, the power of the gospel, Jesus Christ, the Savior of sinners, has come into this woman, has changed her life. That's why the man is angry. And then he goes out and he begins to tell stories about deeper life. He says, Ah, deeper life, they did me evil. 
they took my, she won't say my prostitute, my concubine, she'll say they took my friend away from me. Ah, is that a friend? That man had his own wife at home and is making this woman not to prepare for her future, not to have a husband, not to have children, just be a prostitute. That's not a friend. You are taking care of yourself and your family and you do not allow this woman to think of herself and her family. That's not a friend. And you know, we'll make a noise about it and gather people together and just brainwash them and they're all angry. And they say, oh yes, deeper life is bad. Rock music is good. Deeper life is bad. Abortion is good. Deeper life is bad. Immorality is good. Deeper life is bad. All these other bad things they do in the night, in the dark, all those things are good. And then all the multitude, they begin to shout, yes, yes, yes. That's mob. That's multitude. That's how they react. And that's the thing that happened here. But if you are a student of the Bible, you will understand that all the things the multitudes are saying, there is no truth in those things. Look at verse 29. Where is confusion? The whole city was filled with confusion because of a single man coming out to say something that was wrong. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in trouble, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore, look at this, some therefore cried one thing, and some another for the assembly was confused and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together did you understand that everybody started shouting oh paul is a wicked man paul is a bad man paul is a confucianist paul is causing trouble and everybody just accepted it and there was no small stir I brought confusion in the whole city. Then when some people talked to them and said, Who is this Paul? Have you ever met him? I'm sorry, no. How do you know he's bad? I don't know. Why are you crying? Saying that this is bad and that is good? Well, I heard those other people saying it. So I picked it up with them. Then he went to the other people. Now, how are you? Fine. You see there is trouble, yes, there is trouble. You are part of the trouble, yes, I, I, we are just crying that this, there is a man called Paul, this Paul is very, very bad, he's teaching people to, to lose their money, to throw away all the things that are important to them, all precious silver, to throw everything away and to give all their money away, not to be interested in money, not to work at all. He's telling all the people that we don't need to work, heaven is now coming, heaven is uh, the important thing. Fold your hand, don't walk. Did you hear him say that? No. How do you know he said that? Well, I just know he said that. Have you ever gone to his meeting? No. Have you ever met him before? No. Who told you all these things that you are saying? I can't name a particular person. That's what I heard others saying and I picked it up. And that's more. And it's the same thing today. You ask people. Some people that say, Ah, deeper life never in my life if that is the only way to get to heaven i will get to hell i am angry i hate those people i don't like them i hear that they don't wear clothes they go about naked they don't have chairs in their houses they sit on the floor they don't eat good food they drink gary all they do is evangelism they don't go to work at all and they go from convention to retreat from retreat to crusade and from crusade to watch night service and from bagada to the house they don't go anywhere in the whole world except bagada and you say, man, keep cool. Have you known them before? No, 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 but I know that they don't work. They don't work. They don't do anything at all. And they, they don't marry. They don't have children. They don't have anything. All they do is just get ready for heaven and then pray for the sick. That's all they do. Have you been there before? No, I will never go there. I'm not part of them. But how are you so angry against them? Now listen. I've been there. All that you are saying is not true. Eh? You mean it is not true? 
But I hear they take other people's wives and go give to members of their church. That's what I'm telling you. All you are saying is not true. But how did you know all these things? You are saying, well, I heard some people saying so at the bus stop. And so I too, I started saying it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's how people are angry. Angry for nothing. And they do not know the basis of what they are saying. And, um, you know, some of these people, and some of you are laughing now. Because that's how you were before. And then you came and you said, ah, ah, so these people are nice like this. And then you begin to repent, saying, oh, Lord, I'm sorry for all the things I said. You see, that's mob psychology. The mob, a multitude, they just pick up things that they are not sure about. And it says in verse 33, and they drew Alexander out of the multitudes. The Jews putting him forward, and Alexander beckoned with the hand and would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Just two hours. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. They were sweating and crying. The sun was beating them, they were shouting. And nobody could hear anything. The whole place was in terrible confusion. They used the energy that the devil gave them to cry aloud and publicize just for the idol. But then we're told in verse 35 the coming of the riot. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not? How the city of the Ephesians is a worshipper of the great goddess Diana. That was a superstition. Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, ye ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. This man was not a Christian. This man was himself an idol worshipper, but he had the cool head. And as an idol worshipper talking to other idol worshippers, he said, Men of Ephesus, why are you shouting? Why are you crying? Why are you saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians? Who doesn't know that uh, the Ephesians, that they are all worshippers of the great goddess Diana? And seeing that nobody, nobody, he had never, he had not gone to Paul the Apostle to listen to the message of the only true God. And the only Savior, Messiah, Christ, Jesus, he didn't know all about that. And he said, oh, you know that these things cannot be spoken against you or to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For ye have brought you that these men, which are neither robbers of churches nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with, which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open and there are deputies let them implead one another but if ye inquire anything concerning other matters it shall be determined in a lawful assembly for we are in danger to be called in question this day for this day is uproar there be no cause thereby we may give an account of this concourse and when he had thus spoken he dismissed the assembly now the question is what was the gain the benefit of these people that left their children left their studies left their families left everything important they were doing and they came right into the streets under the blazing sun under the heat of the sun just crying great is diana the goddess of the Ephesians, for two hours where is the gain now Communication is very important. This man that spoke to all these people, one man can cause trouble. One man also can cause peace and quietness. He said, now everybody, be quiet. Why are you shouting and crying like this? All the things you are accusing these men of, they are neither robbers of churches, nor blasphemers against your goddess. We have not heard them use any bad language that will amount to profanity or blasphemy against the goddess. Of course, they believe in the only true God. 
but they communicate their message in such a straightforward, wonderful manner. And if you have found anything that is wrong, the court of law is there. Do everything decently and in order. With all that, he quiet in them. But you have learned something tonight. Did you learn anything? That the people of this world, they are after their gain. The, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is doing a lot of good. Changing lives, changing things, changing families. But because it's affecting them in the unlawful gain of money they make so they're against the gospel because it's affecting them in the evil immoralities that they they do that's why they are crying out and many of them will go against a church like this teaching the truth without fear without favor teaching the truth that will change lives convert souls but we thank God because we'll continue to pray for them. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Because if you knew the good that God has done to individuals, to families, to society, to many, many people through the preaching of the gospel in this church, every time you open your mouth and you mention this church, you'll be giving, you'll be showing gratitude to God. But all those who are opposing, all those who are contradicting, all those who are talking against a church like this, the only prayer we have is, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. The sick, they are being healed. Lives are being changed. Young men that are wasting their lives and smoking Indian hair, destroying the tissues of their body, even destroying their brain, even destroying the prospect, the, the, the future of their lives. Their lives are being changed by the power of God in this church. Families are being reunited. Wayward children are being corrected. And those who didn't have any goal in life, who will just work and spend all the money aimlessly without any profit, sense is coming into them sanity is coming into them life is coming into them they are now having a good direction to follow a good direction to go and uh, there are many many people that are barren God has given them children many people that were mediocre before they were never do wells before the message of the gospel in this church has transformed them and changed their lives and um, all the people outside, religious people, idol worshippers, goldsmiths and tailors and farmers and lawyers and doctors and engineers and ignorant people, ignorant of what God is doing in this place that oppose this church with all the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful things God is doing. All we can say is, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do incurable diseases taken away lives changed souls cleansed born again names written in the book of life in their hundreds and thousands and yet people will rise up and say oh that place they would even say sometimes you know things that are far out that you wonder how could somebody imagine that they will do that on the face of the earth bad bad thing they will say oh that's what they do there but we are praying for them father forgive them they know not what they do but the spirit of the lord is saying now you leave the mob leave the crowd and come in come in because there is a lot here Jesus Christ, the Savior, Jesus Christ, the great physician, Jesus Christ, the Lord, Jesus Christ, the coming King, is saying, come in and I will do you good. A lot of good things are taking place here. A lot of good things are taking place here. Don't be on the fence. Don't be outside. Don't be part of the group outside criticizing without knowing even what they're saying. Come in and come and enjoy the good things, the wonderful things that God has. And as you come in, your life will never be the same again. If you have tried everything on the face of the earth, psychology, philosophy, medicine, juju, magic, whatever it is you have tried, you wanted a change and you could never get the change. 
a moment in this church was the power of Jesus Christ was the fire of the Holy Ghost was the anointing coming from above it will come upon you and change your life the things you have found impossible you'll find that they are very easy with God and they are possible with God now, Satan knows that, that once you step in, once you give your life, once you say, I am going to be part of that militant, progressive, successful people of God, Satan knows that a dynamic, mighty change will happen in your life. That's why he's telling all those lies outside, outside, so as to terrify you, so as to make you run back, so as to make you say, well, I don't know that that is such a place, I will never go there. This is a place that will make you to achieve what what God wants you to achieve in your life come in come in and you tell the Lord I am in here I close my ears to what those liars are saying outside I want you to know the power that has changed other people in this place I want to know that power and you will know that power and that power can come into your life and make that mighty change even right now it can happen to you if you'll make up your mind I'm not going to stay on the fence. I'm not going to stay outside. I am coming in and I'm going to get the best that God has for me. That miracle will start right now. Rise up and let's pray.